Uh, sermon number three that we're going with today. You can take out your bulletins uh, and on the sermon outline draw a big X over it. Uh, this is what I felt led to preach early this morning. And it's called How to Position Yourself for a Breakthrough. How to Position Yourself for a Breakthrough. And we don't have notes, and, and the folks will do, they'll try to keep up with Scripture up on the screens, but if you don't get it, that's okay, because I know we're going off the cuff here a little bit. Um, this is a last-minute change, and by the way, I may challenge... Some theology. Is that okay? Amen. I want my theology. I want someone to challenge my theology every now and then. I want to make sure that I can. I know what I believe. And if I challenge your theology, don't, don't, don't gripe about it. Go to the scripture and search it out. Amen. And if, if we don't agree at the end of the day, I still love you. And you have to love me. Positioning is very important. For those of you who are athletes, and one of my strengths as a player was a rebounder. Uh, just I have the perfect body for rebounding a wide body, a very wide base, and a big old rear end. Okay, and that's just that's just what you want to have, and that's just what I was successful at. And, and one of the things that made me a great rebounder was the ability to know where the ball was going to go and to predict that. And then when you know where the ball's going to go, you don't necessarily go there. You go to the person that's near there, and then you establish position. And you get there, and you get wide, you get your butt low, you get your elbows out, and sometimes the ref's not looking, you go like this, okay? And then you step on their feet, all sorts of things you can do. But <laughs> bottom line, you get wide, you get low, and then you back them out just a little bit so when that ball comes off, you've got the best opportunity to reach up there and grab it. And, and the less you can jump, the more important positioning is. Ask me how I know. <sighs> now, not only is positioning important in sports, it's hunting season. And many of you out there, Elmer Fudd's getting Bambies and Thumpers. I'm going to get the Wabbit. <laughs> and you can know that your position will have a great impact on your ability to be successful. You know the word vegetarian in Greek means lousy hunter. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> but you know, you hunters, you have, and I had no idea how big this had gotten, but you have trail cameras. And you go out and you put cameras on trees. And that they record stuff so that you can know the proper position to be in so you can kill Bambi. There's some big stuff in that. Now, I'm not just talking to men. What about you ladies? Is positioning important? Oh, yes, it was Black Friday. And you know, they've got that combobulation that you've been wanting for years. And it was $350. That was just a little bit out of your price range. But on Black Friday from 2 to 6 a.m., it was going to be $49.99. And you found, ladies, that you can't just show up and expect to get your combobulation for $49.99 because if you are out of position, it will be gone before you get there. And you have to correctly position yourself using certain tactics that we will not talk about in church. But successful Black Friday shoppers have their map. And they have their, they plan this thing. Okay, we're going to go here, we're going to go there. And we go by order of priority. And, oh, this store, they always run out, so I'm going to go there first. And I'm going to be in line over here. And I know this stuff is kept over here. So when they open that door, I'm over there. You're positioning yourself for a sale. Glory to God. <laughs> and the list goes on. Position is important. We also know that in this life, there will be many difficulties. There will be trials and tribulations and afflictions. We know that Jesus says, not if 
the storm comes, when the storm comes. You will experience adversity in this life. What I want to talk to you about today is how to position yourself for the adversity, trial, and tribulation in the storms of life so when they come, not if they come, you have the best chance of success of getting through. How to win in adversity. Number one, what you do in peacetime has a great impact on how you react in wartime. You see, what you do when everything's going good has a great deal of impact on what you will do when everything's not going good. Really? Can you give me some examples? December 7, 1941. Pearl Harbor. We did not take the Japanese threat seriously. And as a result, many of our servicemen lost their lives needlessly because we were not prepared. We had good indication they were coming. And we were lethargic. 9-11. Our foreign policy on terrorism, we diminished it. We did not take the threat seriously. And in the 10 years previous to 9-11, we spent more trying to prosecute Bill Gates for a monopoly than we did on defending our borders from terrorism. Well, we've learned a lot since then. Because I have it on record when somebody, uh, our leader, was asked about Russia. And his direct quote, the 80s called, they want their foreign policy back, Putin is not a threat. Direct quote. We've got to take it seriously. Or when we talk about ISIS, and the direct quote, that is a junior varsity terrorist organization. Now, I'm not putting down a person at all. At the same time, we have sometimes, in the name of ideology, not taken threats seriously that should have been taken seriously. And the sad thing is, in the church, we're guilty of the same thing. You see, the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, we did a whole series on this a few months back, your adversary, the devil, is like a lion roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. And we have sometimes forget that there is a devil he wants to, to kill, steal from, and destroy your life, take out your children, and do it as slowly and painfully as possible for the very simple point he gives great pleasure and hurting God who loves you. He cannot hurt God except for hurting God's children. The devil hates your guts. And there is a war on your life. And you wear a bullseye the minute you got born again. Sometimes there's altar calls, oh, come to Jesus, you'll find peace. So, yeah, you will find peace, but it's not the peace that comes from the absence of calamity and disaster. It's the type of peace that comes in the midst of calamity and disaster. That's why it's called a supernatural peace. Because it doesn't make sense in the natural. <laughs> Our family, uh, and I, I was with Pastor Abe Huber. I mentioned that to you. And one of the things he shared with me that God really convicted him, and in doing him, he convicted me, and just how important family devotions are. And I have to agree and we're as our family right now our devotional we're going through is a book called the screw tape letters by c.s lewis how many have heard of that book some of you excellent read and in this book it's a conversation between satan and one of his demons letters and it gives you a different look to recognize how satan and his kingdom are strategizing to try to take you down as an individual and it just tells us how much he hates you and how much trouble he goes through to try to trip you up in your faith. 
You see, there is a devil. He hates us. We know from Matthew chapter 25, there were ten virgins. It's this parable. It says there were five were wise and five were foolish. And the differentiation between the wise and the foolish, the wise brought extra oil, the foolish brought just enough. And when the bridegroom was delayed, the five that did not have the extra oil, their lamps went out. The five that did have the extra oil, their lamps were able to burn and causing a great division. Five were able to attend the wedding ceremony. Five were not able to attend the wedding ceremony. Now that's a whole different sermon. Sometimes people have likened those virgins as to the brides. They were not the brides. They were the bridal party. They were the bridal party. And five got to attend, five did not. But the difference was five prepared, five did not. Ladies and gentlemen, I want Jesus to come back today. I want Jesus to come back tomorrow. Now, I'm praying for that. Meanwhile, all the teenagers over there, they're praying for him to come back a long time from now. So our prayers, I don't know if they cancel out or how that works. I hope he does come back. But if he does not come back in my lifetime, I've got to be prepared, and you need to be prepared to live out our lives, to go through decades of life, to go through ups and downs in your family. It, sometimes, yes, even in your health or your finances, you've got to understand. And even as a nation, there there is a reality we've got to learn from history that just because we have a red, white, and blue flag does not mean that we're invincible. So what we do in peacetime has a great impact on what we do in wartime. And I want you, I say this with this understanding in mind, I hope you understand I am a loving shepherd. My job is to protect and provide for you. I don't get paid just to get a calendar and fill it. I don't get a bonus for how many dates on the calendar we have monopolized. My job is not just to keep you busy. It never says, well, busy, good and faithful. It says, well, done. What we do better have an impact or we don't do it. Now, with my responsibility to shepherd, to protect, to provide... Two of the greatest weapons we have in our stand against the wiles of the wicked one are the word of God and prayer. And there are times we do things different in Sunday morning church. It might be a clap. For instance, it was the, 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 the treasure principle or passing out the book uh, on uh, the four blood moons or the book on the treasure principle or having classes on marriage or th different things. We don't do that once again. I'm not just sitting there with darts, throwing them in the calendar, saying, let's do it here, let's do it. We do that as a leading of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we have a responsibility to make disciples. All right. That is my charge. My charge is not to make converts. My charge is to make disciples. And I've got to train you and prepare you for the adversity. I've got to prepare you and train you to, now you can help train yourself, that's helpful too, but as a pastor, I've got to make sure I'm leading this church in a way that equips you for the work of the ministry, edifies you in the knowledge of Christ, and educates you in Ephesians chapter 4, says, till we all come to the unity and the fullness of the stature of faith. That's my job. And so when we do these things, I want you to know, I'm not just trying to make you miserable, give you something else to do. It's because I'm trying to give you extra oil. Why? Because there's going to come a time when it doesn't go how we want it to go. And you're going to need that extra oil. You see. We know Hebrews chapter 10 Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, especially all the more as you see the day approaching. Well, I know that's just a pastor's favorite scripture. It's not just that it's my favorite scripture. That's a, that is a spiritual command. That's a spiritual warning to say, you know what? As the days get more and more evil, 
You need more and more of the things of God in your life. And those five foolish virgins who ran out of oil, there was great commotion that early morning. We don't have any oil. What are we going to do? We don't have any oil. Oh, will you please give us some oil? Would you please give us some oil? Now, we know God is rich in mercy. And your church family is rich in mercy. And I'm glad that we don't have to be like those other five virgins and say no. We don't have to do that. We can say yes. But at the same time, when I hear, when I, one of the ways I can tell if someone has prepared in peacetime is when they hit calamity, are they, help, help, help. Remember that olive oil. Remember olive oil and, and she's like, help, that most annoying voice. Help. And when we see Christians flailing, help, we're going down, help. They're out of oil. They're out of oil. Now we'll do everything we can to help you. We'll do everything we can. But it's a lot easier to help somebody when they've got the oil they need. All right. Number two. Oh, this is where we're going to start. Are you kidding me? Number two. Uh, you're up there changing the clock forward, aren't you? You're trying to get out of here early. Number two. Understand the sovereignty of God. Oh, this is a fun one. You say, do you understand the sovereignty of God, Pastor Matt? I'm learning. I'm learning. If I told you I completely understand it, I think that would be a lie. I don't think there's any of us who would completely understand the sovereignty of God. I will tell you, I understand a lot more today than I did 20 years ago. There's two spectrums to the sovereignty of God. One is kind of the Calvinistic approach. Whatever happens is the will of God. And the other one is we have complete control as humans. And how many of y'all know what do we seek as Christians? Balance. I was raised personally more over here in the camp that says we've got the power. You know, we're saying that we've got the power. Dun, 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 dun. All right. Uh, others were raised whatever happens we accept it as a sovereign will of God we've got to have the balance to those who are Calvinistic I would say this is it not God's will that everyone be saved yet not everybody is saved what does that mean what we do matters why are we told to pray for the peace of Jerusalem? Because how we pray matters. Even Jesus said, our prayers may have something to do with the timing of the return of Christ. Because he said, pray that your flight not be in winter. Our prayers can impact the timing of the coming of the Messiah. And scripture after scripture, we see what we do matters. Matthew 25, the virgins. We see the parable of the talents, what they did with the talents, had an impact on how they lived. The goats and the sheep, how they treated their fellow man, had great impact on how they, how they were rewarded by God. Timothy, Paul tells Timothy about people, says, hey, if they get rid of the wood, they get rid of the clay, and become vessels of gold and silver, they can be useful. Jesus at Nazareth. If we had absolute sovereignty, he would have been able to do mighty works in Nazareth. But he, Jesus, the Bible says, could not do mighty works there. Why? Because of their unbelief. There goes my oil. All right. 
But to those over here who believe, oh man, we have all the power, we got all the faith, we can, you know, the old term it used to say, blab it, grab it, name it, claim it, say it, seize it. All right, some of you, if you've been raised in the church for many years, you remember those terms. That's what I was raised under. Blab it, grab it. In other words, you say it, you can have it. You just, faith is your ticket to everything. Glory to God. And man, you can preach some fun messages that way. That is some good preaching material. But let me tell you, it's really hard to pastor. Why? Because it don't always work that way. Sugar. You got Bible for that, Pastor Matt? As a matter of fact, I do. I don't like to preach on this much, but it's a fact. The great Apostle Paul, the one who they would allow handkerchiefs to touch his body, and those handkerchiefs would be so full of the power of God, they could take it to a different city far away, lay it on somebody, and they would be healed. This great Apostle Paul. It says about a ministry companion of his in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20. It says, Paul left one of his buddies named Trophimus sick. Now that's Paul who healed everybody else, but this guy. And Paul left him sick. Now there's a lot of theology there for how the church should operate right there. We'll get into that a different time. Probably will never get into that. Paul left. Now, I thought we could just lay our hands on the sick and they would recover. And that's the great apostle Paul, right? But Trophimus is sick. And he left. We see another guy by the name of Epaphroditus. Sick, a, a laborer in God. Sick almost to death. As a matter of fact, it gives a reason. Says he worked himself to death. He was so work-oriented, he literally got himself, for the gospel's sake, to the point where he almost died. You see. And I have a buddy, and this is a good kind of buddy you want to have. He has a, 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 um, a deep sea fishing operation in Florida. Good friend to have, let me tell you. <laughs> and he's also a pastor. And so when we go down to Florida, we'll go fishing and catch big fish. It's a lot of fun. It's about the only time I ever catch big fish is when he has to hook it and hand me the pole. So here, reel this in. <laughs> so... And he's telling me about an experience he had. You know, he's one of the best-known charter captains in Florida, a very successful guy. And they were taking him, he was taking a group of preachers, that's all he knew, out on the ocean. Well, I happen to be very famous preachers, and there's someone who's on television every single day who's a big-time faith guy. Blab it, grab it, say it, seize it, name it, claim it. And they get out there, and there's a little bit of wind that day, and there's three to four foot waves. And for whatever reason, every single one of those preachers got seasick. Every single one of them. These are all faith healers. Now, he was just watching. He didn't, you know, volunteer any, any theological advice. He just watched. And they're all, in the name of Jesus, I'm not seasick. In the name of Jesus, quit vomiting. In the name of Jesus, I'm healed. In the name of Jesus, I'm not seeing. And they did it. And, and, and he said, you know, they, it was an eight-hour trip. And they vomited and vomited and vom and they were green. And I've I've been on the I was with, I was up on Lake Michigan in eight-foot waves, um, and uh, I've seen people get seasick. And I've seen Andrea and her sister Tiffany. They say gr they turn green. They turn green. It is disgusting to look at, and even more disgusting to smell. And he said, these guys had turned green. And the whole time, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Well, they get, did they get healed? Yeah, about two hours after they got back to shore. The balance has got to be somewhere. Because the Bible tells us to lay our hands on the sick and they shall recover. The Bible tells us that the elders of the church are to pray the prayer of faith over the sick and it will save the sick. So we know we've got to find that balance. We know we can't go to hyper-Calvinism. At the same time, we have to respect that God is sovereign, and there are times God chooses to interject his sovereignty. And 
as much as I want to have control and as much as I want to be able to say I know when and where, I'm not always going to know that. But let me say this. When we read scripture, the vast majority, everybody say vast majority, of the time we see God saves, God heals, God delivers. Are there exceptions? Yes. But the vast majority of the time, do we want to base our theology on the exceptions and make the exceptions our reality or do we want to fight for faith let me share this same thing about our nation does our nation seem hopeless yes it does should we retain hope yes we should why because i'm going to go for it i'm not just going to sit back and allow the nation that i love to go to hell and if i die in faith Without receiving the promises, I get to be like Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. It says, they all died in faith, not having yet received the promises, who were counted. It says, that, oh, I've got it written out here. Come on, I don't want to misquote it. Ah, here it is. Having, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. In other words, we get to the place where we recognize this earth is not my home. I'm not going to live based on this hope. I'm not going to live based on these limitations. I'm going to hope for everything that heaven has to offer. That's my home. That's where I'm living. And I might not get everything I want here on earth, but that's not my home anyway. I'm living for this, not for this. You all, you didn't have to go to lunch, get hungry, and be full of your flesh. I would be able to keep preaching. Amen. Number three would have been determine whether the cause of your calamity is yourself the devil, or this is something that God is leading you into. Because there are three completely way, different ways to go about dealing with it. And four and five are awesome too. <laughs> oh, my. Well, that's enough for today. Uh, we'll have some prayer partners up front here in a minute. And if you are going through something, once again, we don't know what you dealt with on the way to church today. We don't know what you did with at home, and we don't know what the doctors may have said this week or what your bills may have said this week. But don't, don't leave here without getting agreement in prayer for something that you need agreement in prayer for. And we'll have prayer partners up here. In the meantime, let's pray. I was going to preach on joy today. I didn't. It was a good message. But I'll tell you this. When you're full of God, you can have joy in trial and tribulation and affliction. In the middle of a Nazi extermination camp, you can rejoice. And if you're not full of joy, you can be in the middle of the greatest nation on earth at one of the greatest times on earth and one of the greatest churches on earth and find fault with anything and everything and find a reason to be miserable. Can't you? Well, we better shut up or we'll just, but just, just go. Lord, we bless your name. We exalt you. Thank you for every blessing you've bestowed upon us. Thank you for this great nation we have, this great earth we live on. Thank you for our spouses, our children, our many blessings. And Lord, today as we 
heard the word about preparing in peacetime. I pray that we would examine our lives and see what else we can do to make sure that when adversity comes knocking at our door, we're going to be ready and we're going to win in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you hopefully tonight or this week sometime. We're dismissed.